So, uh, so I'm going to be talking about the KDC talk, and you know, last last year I tried to integrate, you know, my, my talk again, also along union lines with um, uh, trying to insert something useful for everybody on a on a psychological level, professional level, and linking it to the upcoming MNRI. And man, did I have a hard time because as everybody is kind of talking over here, is Jung is incredibly complex. You know, going through his 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 collected writings. Good luck with that. And a lot of what I'm drawing from is his book Ion, which basically you have to take a couple stiff drinks before you crack that baby open. It, it is such a deep and frightening book. And so, trying to cut through the weeds of how Jung conceptualized the, the, the map of the psyche, trying to keep it relatable and not fall into the mysticism unintentionally, but too intentionally fall into the mysticism of Jung's work uh, was pretty tough. And so I've been, I've been reading Jung's work and um, different Jungian analysts for the past several years. I thought, okay, fine, no problem. I, you know, I'll just kick this back, get some, come, uh, do, some, do some more thorough analysis of different midrashim in the text itself of the Kedis Yitzchak. And I had an intuitive feeling that this just completely makes sense, that the Kedis Yitzchak is a, is a narrative fundamentally about how one does individuate. And God, I was a mess. I, like last night, I tell you guys, I was, I was doing this for seven hours trying to organize my thoughts and I just couldn't do it. I gave up. I thought, I'm gonna have to just not give this talk. And I thought, geez, my mother-in-law's gonna kill me. I'm like, oh, I can't do the talk, sorry. <laughs> So, so, and I got like, th I got three hours of sleep. Now, while I was sleeping in good Jungian fashion, an old, an old man approached me in my dream. I was sitting at a desk. It was completely dark. And I was sitting with all these papers open up in front of me of what, what I was trying to plan out to present to everybody. And this very nice old man just came over and he said, what are you doing? And so he put his hand on my shoulder and he started pointing at different things. And when I woke up, I said, great. I tried to write everything down as best I could in terms of the, of the notes. I trashed everything that I had done last night, and I'm still not happy with what I got for you guys. But I think that's pretty good for how I'm going to try and end this talk. Because there's, there's, a, there's a certain poeticness in, uh, in, in, in my whole process of having a substandard presentation for everybody today, and Avraham realizing his own substandard, his, his inability to sufficiently serve Hashem. So that's where I'm going to try and hit, and I'm probably not going to make it, and, and uh, as, a, as a side note, I, I, I don't usually rely so much on notes, but I'm going to be heavily relying on my notes because I kind of just finished it up like 20 minutes before we started the peer supervision. So that's, that's, that's where I'm at right now. Stepping back, the, the question, who is Avram Vina? Before getting into uh, 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 outlining uh, the, the the psychic map of Jung before getting into the narrative, I, you know, I want to set up the players, and looking at looking at the different Forshim, looking at the both Rishonim and Achronim, I, I found the most intriguing uh, Rov Joseph Soloveitchik's understanding of Abraham. It wasn't it was it didn't exactly fit the way that that um, I personally would imagine Avraham Avinu. The guy was a rebel. He was an anarchist. Mm -hmm. This guy, you know, if 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 you would if you would you know bust out the big five personality uh, test here, the guy, he is super high in extroversion, super high in in, in openness, low in neuroticism. Th this guy, but as di disagreeable as sin, I do not believe for one second that Movino had had any semblance of agreeableness. He was very disagreeable to the world that he was born into. And what that produced in terms of the relationship that he, he discovered through his disagreeable nature with Hashem was a very agreeable God. Rasul comments, especially in the, in the emergence of the ethical man, he points out several times that, that the God of Avram Rabinu is definitely not the God of Moshe Rabinu. They are not the same encounter. They're buddies. They hang out. It's buddy God. How you doing, Abraham? I'm over here. You know, even with the with with the different uh, the slight the slight uh, um, hints and winks and midrashim of of say the the, the midrash of the burning palace and the, and the opening of the window the, the wave 
of of the of the person inside the palace, the wigs. It's there. There's such a palpable sense of there are there is a call to journey from Hakadosh Baruch Hu, and not a call of law that was received from Moshe Rabbeinu. Avram argues with God. There's there's all these different aspects to it, and what what that ultimately as a as a symbol as an archetype. I'm going to get into what these terms mean. Avram is the, it was, I'm going to argue was, the archetype of Chesed. In Gemara Ksubis, the, the, Gemara, the Gemara states our, as, a, as, a, as a directive of how to govern one's life that our brothers act lovingly to one another and are the children of those who act lovingly to one another who maintain the covenant of Avraham Avinu. Rashi there describes Avraham is the quintessential act in motion of Chesed. Uh, he, quite, he quotes the Pusik of Breshis of Avram, uh, Avram Avinu planting the, the, the Eshel, this, this, this tree in Be'er Sheva, and, and, and gives a couple interpretations that this was either an orchard or this was a hotel. Either way, the, the, the way that Avraham acted out his understanding of the Kodesh Baruch Hu was through Chesed. God gives us everything. God really is our buddy in a lot of different ways. If everything is sitting on, on his humility, allowing us to have the lives we have fundamentally and giving us the ability to choose the lives we want to have. That's chesed. In Hechus Deus, manifest in Halacha. It is a mitzvah's ase to emulate God. And there's no scary things on that list of Halacha Bedrachah. Be nice, be merciful, be gracious. All the other stuff about God, the God of Moshe Rabbeinu, isn't exactly there. In turning towards the, the life of Avram, Avram had ten Nisim. I'm going to, a little bit later, I'm going to put a little dog ear on that. What, what are Nisim? What is a test? I have a little bit of a mach locus there, and I want to be adopting the Rambam's position on that. So a little spoiler alert. But Avram had ten tests that he had to undertake. And through most of them, like I said, that there was more of a sense of God was providing him the opportunity to manifest this archetype of chesed. More or less up until test nine. As the Rambam understands the ten and you have different lists, you know, Rabbi Yona has a different list, Rashi has a different list. There, there isn't exactly a standard in terms of what these ten are, but, but adopting the, the, the Rambam Shita. Test number one is leaving work Hazadim. Like, the aspect there is the only, you can only do good if you're willing to go out of your comfort zone. You have to go in the world to do good. We got the famine as soon as, as, soon as Avram hits Eretz Israel. There is, there is, a, there is a charitableness in believing God who promised, hey, this is going to be your land and, and, and you're going to rock and roll here. And Abraham's like, yeah, really? It doesn't look like I'm going to rock and roll here. But there's a charitableness that he gives to Kosh Baruch Hu and is willing to go to Mitzrayim. The violation, the abduction, and near violation of his wife, Sarah, in Mitzrayim, he's willing to pray for the perpetrator. The War of the Four Kings. He's willing, to, he's willing to risk his life and no other. Well, Eliezer maybe tags along, Machlokas there, but he's willing, he's willing to put his life on the line for, for a cousin who's abandoned fundamentally his way of life, joining the city of Stone. Taking of Hagar as, as a surrogate, he's giving children to his wife, Sar. Mila, good grief, giving up as an act of chesed, trying to subdue his sexual urges and give his, his, his better angels over, over to Hashem. And number seven, Sar is taken again, the Melech of Grar, and the same narrative, we're praying for the bad guys. Act of chesed, every step of the way. And around trial eight, things start getting a little dark. Send out Hagar. Avram doesn't like that. 
you can try and argue there's a little bit of, I mean, there's, there's some chesed in there in terms of maintaining his relationship with his wife. I mean, there, we do have to have a hierarchy of values fundamentally, and, you know, chesed is just not willy-nilly. Okay, but it's dark. It's not so, it's not so, it's not as clean as the other seven had been. Send out Yishmael, his son. Again, same thing. Okay, we got to maintain, we got to protect my, my new kid. He is, this guy is kind of bad news. The whole, you know, hunting, fishing, smoking, fighting thing that Yishmael's got going on. Okay, fine, bad influence. Fair enough. There's, there's, still, there's still a reach, a smell of chesed within Abra Medina. And he was successful in all of these trials. All trials which were not commanded of him, by the way. At no point, again, not the God of Moshe Rabbeinu. There is no tzivui in any of these. There's a passion, there's a calling, there's a sense of journey and togetherness, and in every single one of these nine, Hashem is there to help. They're in it together. What I find interesting and kind of deepening the character of Avram Ravina was that there's a certain, despite the successes that he had personally, his successes in the world were not as impactful, let's say. Standing in, in Ur Khazdim and then later in Egypt, which we don't have any idea how long he was there, we could assume days or enough, maybe perhaps even years. He didn't was not able to manage to form a, a solid continuous stable following in his in his in his life journey with God. It's just him and God. Again, the buddy thing. And then we have Yitzchak's birth. And here's where things get a little weird. I took from Gemara Sanhedrin. There was a medrash there where after Avraham had 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 Put on the put on the the feast, celebration of his son, celebrating Hashem. I mean, fundamentally, I mean that that's the, that's the motif. The Medrash says, and it came to pass after these events that God tempted Abraham. What is it meant by in the text after the you know, after the after uh, after uh, in the, the beginning of the of this narrative is you know after after these events? So what does it mean by by after? It means after the words of the Satan, because on the day that Yitzchak was weaned, Avra made a feast, and the Satan said to God, "You've given a child to this old man. You've given him a hundred years. Yet as 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 he feasts." He's not made one single offering to you. Not even a dove. Nothing. He's given nothing to you. And in fact, I thought it was very interesting, Rasulovachik, Tainas, that that in all the examples within the the, the life narrative of Avraham, he never once actually gave a Corbin. He would make a bummer, and that's it. I thought that was interesting. Again, this theme of their shefa and giving, and hey, you know, it's... It, Life with God can be a party of sorts. There isn't a darker, the darker sense uh, within Avram Vino at all, in his character. But there was Bruce Green and the Sun, wasn't that? Not a Corbin, not a Corbin. And Avraham is willing to spill a little blood when he needs to. I mean, after all, the, the War of the Four Kings. But again, there is no sacrifice, technically, to a ship. He didn't feel guilt. He didn't feel, meaning he didn't feel he needed to do the sacrifice because well, I, and then what I'm arguing is I, I think it's the unique relationship he had with Hashem. That, that's what that's what I'm arguing in, in my presentation. We can is there guilt and what's the purpose of Corbanos and we can get into that, but I'm I'm getting around that with my with my with my assertion here. Without a Corban. 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 So, Rev Harris says a lot about the symbolism of, of, of what the distinction is between a bum and a Mizbeach. And, and the way he would understand is that a bum is more the subduing of the natural world in the service of Hashem. So it's, it's in the idea of service as opposed to sacrifice. It's an idea of refinement as opposed to, as opposed to giving up. So I would, I, would, I would go along those lines. I would go along those lines. So the matter continues. 
So the Satan ends with the argument. So therefore, the feast was only for the honor of Yitzchak. Now God said, hey, if I were to tell Avram to sacrifice his son, he'd do it without hesitation. So immediately after the Torah tells us that, that God tested Avraham and asked him to please sacrifice his son. The brisker rub, de again, deepening, deepening the, the, the implication of not just sacrificing one's child, but, but the brisker rub in his, his parish on Barashis expands how it, it's, I don't want to make it sound as though it's like, not only he's sacrificing his son, I mean like he's sacrificing his son, but, but everything was promised to him through his son. Everything Abraham worked for, strived for, all other tests that he overcame. At this moment, God is asking him to make them meaningless in his service to God. More than that, in Medrash Tanhuma, the Medrash, Medrash over there makes clear that Avram was well aware that as soon as his wife would find out about what he was about to do to his son, that she would die of grief. He's not just sacrificing his future, he's also sacrificing his past that he built with his wife. God is taking everything from him. I'm putting a pause right here. Because, as I, as I said in the beginning, I think this is fundamentally a story about individuation. And in order to fill in this narrative, what I want to do is I want to give, a, give as brief as I can an analysis of Jung's theories and how he conceptualized how one does become their whole self, becoming more conscious, and how one ought to, as a moral obligation, I have to, they do have to, strive to become more conscious in their lives. Every therapeutic tradition, whether it's CBT, behavioral approach, whatever you want to, whatever you want to pull out here, rests on two fundamental, fundamental ideas. One is epistemological. What is truth? CBTers, mechanistic. Behavioral, it's, it's the, the unfolding of the present moment. What is truth is fundamental to whatever therapy we're practicing. Uh, Stephen Hayes, the developer of ACT, uh, some really good research showing how when one starts, not just him, I mean, there's a, there's a long tradition of this, of, of working eclectically is working ineffectively. Because every therapeutic uh, tool, approach one's using is adopting one unique, definition of truth and is rejecting all others. So number one, therapy rests on what one defines as truth. The second is a question of pragmatics. How does one, how does a therapist enable his client to move forward to embrace and live the truth of, of existence? For Jungians, truth is organic. It, it, it is the idea that everything about you and everything about the world is interrelated on every level. And that while it may seem that, that life is filled with paradox and dialectic, that's really one's own blindness, there are one's own biases, and that in truth, everything is in fact interconnected fundamentally into one single whole. And that all of human history is the unfolding of achieving that integration, that wholeness. Pragmatically, what does that mean as a therapist? You gotta make your client himself. He's got to individuate. He has to confront as a moral question. Jung is very much centered on there is no subjectivity morally. You have to do what's right. Now everyone might have a different mission in life, but in order to, to live morally, you have to, you have to first confront the fact you are lying to yourself in the scariest of ways. So step one, yeah, uh, it tr in a really good, a really good research to read in this is, um, is uh, uh, Bill Trivers. He's one of the founders, one of the, 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 the developers of, of evolutionary psychology, and he has an amazing book on self-deception.
It's a beautiful read, but very much in line, very worthwhile reading from a, from a clinical perspective, how we, we definitely lie to ourselves quite effectively. The second is, is after being able to confront the, the self-lies that, that we tell ourselves, that we have to integrate the truths that we discover about every part of our psyche. And by doing so, by, by, by in some sense becoming less ignorant of yourself, you can now use yourself to do the best you can in this world that you were given. I mentioned Freud. I'm going to use him a bit of as, as, a, as a foil, uh, comparing his model to yours. You know, for Freud had had a had a three a three force model. You know, id, ego, super ego, existing on different levels of consciousness. And for him, he only had two archetypes. He had the eros, which was the, the, the struggle for survival through, uh, through sex and how that manifests in a person's life. And Thanatos, the death instinct, how we're constantly denying the fact that as we sit here and breathe, we are slowly dying. That's Freud in a nutshell. You're very quick. Very, very quick. Very <laughs> quick. Very quick. <laughs> And depressing. It, Freud, it, Freud, 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 Freud was not known for his uh, his ability to, to confront the questions of morality and yeah. transcend. That's that's young. That's why they that's why they separate. Or confront his own issues. He actually died that they, of Berger syndrome. He smoked himself. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Jung's model instead of the iceberg Stop. model of Freud, Jung's model is a solar system. The psyche is the entirety of the solar system, extending and somewhat intermingling on the boundaries of the nervous system. I'll get into this a little bit later with the archetypes. There's, a, there's an idea of what's called a psychoid, where there's a, there's a, there's a emergence theme within Jung, where, where consciousness is constantly emerging and is able to overcome natural boundaries from the, from the psyche to the nervous system, the nervous system from the world itself, uh, there, the, and that gets very much into his idea of synchronicity. I'll be swinging around that later because I kind of need that for the for my crescendo with with Avraham Avinu through this last Nisayan creating a new archetype that did not exist before this moment. So the self sits in the middle of the psyche. It, it, Jung was very um, was extremely pragmatic, despite despite his esoteric thinking, and so he's always speaking about function. What does it do? What does it do? What does it do? Despite the fact he's not a mechanist, by the way, but he ha he has an eye towards function always, and so he sees the self as having it, it, it is being the 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 central um, the central engine of transcendence. That the self itself is constantly expanding infinitely. And it is trying to keep all of the other aspects in the solar system together. That it's, it's gravitational force, so to speak, is keeping the solar system moving and is expressing itself through all the different bodies that exist in the solar system. So the self would be like the sun? Yes, the self is the sun. The self is the sun. Surrounding the, se the self is, is the unconscious. You can think of this as the dark void, all the things that you are unaware of. It, it is un uh, the way that Jung thought about it was that the moment of birth, you are 100% you are potential only. And as you grow, you actualize yourself. Hey, that's great. But every time that you open a door, you close 30 of them. You have infinite potential right before the moment you choose one course of action. And so all that leftover potential is either going to be repressed or simply forgotten in the unconscious. So space is growing, the self is growing, and, and there is that, that relationship between you, you yourself as you actualize or making it that way. He saw the unconscious as existing on two levels. And this is going to repeat as what well, complex as archetypes are also going to be existing on these two fundamental levels. One, the personal, which young, as well as, well as the collective. 
So the unconscious, you can say in, in totality, um, von Franz, von Franz argued what Jung meant whenever he referred to, um, uh, referred to the shadow. He meant the entirety of the unconscious. It's debatable. I don't know. Go read von Franz. She makes a good argument. But uh, be that as it may, what makes up the unconscious, take, take for granted this idea of the shadow, it's everything that, that one d does not want to be a part of their actualized self. It doesn't have to be bad. It's not a question of morality. It's not a question of, of, of good, bad, right, wrong. It's, it's once you've made a choice, that's who you are, and guess what? Ain't getting back. That's just the way it is. It can contain some sort of um, uh, self-judgment. It can contain uh, questions of morality, but, but it's not fundamentally about morality per se. And the reason why I'm making this distinction is because the, the collective unconscious of the shadow is about evil. It is about morality. It is about good and bad. It, it, and it's, it's the, all the, the parts that, that are shared universally. Some, some uh, Jungians, and Jung himself even, no, even Jung himself, uh, argue that, that this, uh, this, would pro would be, uh, this would be on the genetic level of, of the human being. And when the personal and the collective merge together, they're interacting, they will manifest as what Jung called a complex. So great, what's a complex? So we got a couple of them. The ego complex is the most fundamental. This is planet Earth. This is where you sit. This is your consciousness. You can think of your, your ego complex, again, this mixture of your history, uh, important moments, challenges you've had, plus your genetic makeup, uh, is going to create what your consciousness is. It is permanent. It is, it is powerful. It ain't going anywhere. Where, where things get off the rails is the, the other complexes that exist. Jung kind of imagines the way that, that you know, our, our psychic solar system is including these sub-personalities. The, they're sort of like these autonomous uh, entities that have their own energy, they have their own valence, and they have the ability to break through the unconscious and hijack your ego complex. This is when someone presses your button. This is when you reflect upon what you did, and you're like, why the hell did I do that? It, it, is, it is everything that is confusing about you that you would never admit to anyone in this room. That is a complex. They don't go away. Because again, fundamentally, you can kind of imagine the nucleus of this complex is, is going to be all these things I kind of listed both personally as well as collectively. So you're stuck with them. These are your vulnerabilities, whether you like it or not. However, the good news is that they, they create a sort of shell of association. That, that as your complex gets traction, as it expresses itself, as you have, as you have a, a greater awareness of it, you can start changing the associations that you have for these complexes. And this enables your ego complex to be able to tame these possessions. It's probably a good way of thinking about it. So the goal, so the goal of analysis then is, is, to, is to first and foremost try and uncover what these complexes are, most importantly the shadow complex, and show them, to present them to the client, so that through the act of, of joint dialogue, through a fellowship of sorts, and here we have this, you know, uh, mirroring a little bit the idea of Avravino you know, God, two buddies going, going against the world. Through a friendship, the two are raising awareness of these complexes, figuring out what their functions are, what triggers their constellation, and using dream analysis, active imagination, amplification, uh, drawing from mythology, stories that are emotionally powerful, you're changing the associations surrounding the complex.
Very much, very much in line with ACT, by the way. ACT and, and uh, Steve Hayes' work is very much predicated on this, the behavioralist and in terms of behavioral uh, terms, um, this, would be, this would be just basic learning. You can't unlearn anything that you've learned in your life, but what you can do is you can, you can evolve what you've learned in life. So there's a, there's a parallel, I think, in terms of the concept there. It, it, also ha it also has a, it also goes into IFS principles as well. Because IFS stole from them. Right. <laughs> this is very possible that IFS made it more understandable to most of us. And he never quoted you in any of his works. That's I don't bear a grudge. I don't bear a grudge. I don't think that's but true. But I went through his, I went through his references. He does talk about it in his book. I know he does a little yeah. bit. Well, I read Satir either. She's all over the place. A little She's all over bit. IFS. Satir is... Jumping off the page in IFS. Anyway. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, it, but she's not there either. Nobody, it, nobody talks about her either. It, it, it's here? It's here. In no way, shape, or form did a complex just burst through my ego yeah. complex and express bitterness, <laughs> anger, resentment just but now. That didn't happen. He does talk about young. He does. And he talks about it even his lectures. I have in his lectures, he does. Yeah, yeah. In lectures, he does. he does. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, that's just, yeah. But IFS is also a very deep model. It's very spiritual. It has mm -hmm. a lot of young years. When you speak, hear it, it's short, speak to hear it. When you learn it, it's, that's why it's so, one of the reasons. It also is very easy for us to um, to use because, you know, they made it understandable and gave it a format. Incredibly simple. Yeah, that's, its usefulness is that it sacrifices scope, but, I'm sorry, it sacrifices depth, but has scope. So, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's, 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 not, I mean, he's sacrificing union depth. Like, that's there's oh, a yeah, sacrifice yeah. of the depth that's in Young, and there's more of a scope applicability. There's a broader applicability to IFS. Anyway, okay, archetypes. Archetypes are, an, they're, they're more than a complex. Archetypes actually are one part of all complexes. It's, I, I mentioned before, it's, it's psychoid. It, it, it has this both. Um, any better way of putting it? The way Freud understood archetypes was as an instinct. Jung completely disagreed. What an archetype does is it's able to, to give shape, focus, and orders the instinct, and, and is, it manifests instinct in a, in a um, useful, interactive way through image. That's what an archetype does, essentially. And so it, 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 it acts simultaneously as a bridge to the inner world of the unconscious and the outer world one, uh, one uh, acts out in their life. That and it binds people together. But, so, so that's that's, 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 that's called right. it's, that's its transgressive it's nature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, tra it's, tra yeah. It. it's transgressive nature is that it knows no limits. It, it, right. it, and and so there's this a causal aspect to it. It 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 emerges not just out of the, the unconscious realm. It emerges in the in the conscious realm. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like it's born out of you and is expressed in you. It's born from the world and is expressed through you. It's born in us and then gets expressed in the world. It's 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 a it's a metaphysical property which gets into his idea of synchronicity and if you want to get really weirded out again go read Ion and and Jung's work in terms of the occult and spiritual it gets interesting but fundamentally that there's a another way of thinking about it um, um, oh she Joe you know, what's this guy's name he's a physicist he he he's a physicist philosopher maybe his name will come to me. Um, uh, he, he more or less argues that, that uh, Jung's work lays the groundwork for string theory and, and a sense of all of reality is, is, real, is, is unified and you know, whatever, if I remember his name, you know, it's, worth, it's interesting and worth reading and, and uh, mathematical equations are involved in that work as well. So interesting stuff. Anyway, backing up. Yeah, no, no, not no. He's, he's Eastern European. He's, he's, I don't know the guy's name. Anyway. So what uh, again, doggy earing this idea, the the ability for archetypes to be imbued from an individual into the greater world, that's the birth of, of the of the archetype that Avram of you gives to us as we're seeing in the, as this narrative unfolds. So again, doggy earing that idea. Returning back to the shadow. <sighs> Working, working, like as I mentioned before, the working with the shadow complex is the first and foremost goal of any analyst. 
mentioned the, per, the Mayor's Briggs, even though unions hate that, by the way. They absolutely hate Mayor's do. Briggs. They just are there, they, they throw it out, the whole thing. But but yes, it, it, it's playing with uh, the personality types that Jung puts down. And and so, you know, as an analyst, you're first trying to figure out what is the what is the primary personality traits that are expressed, the inferior personality traits that are not expressed so, so profoundly. There's an assumption the inferior personality traits, whatever the last letters in that test, that's going to be your shadow. Right. Whatever doesn't fit with your public persona. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to enable the client to re-own their shadow mm -hmm. and to dive yeah. as deep as you can in confronting their own absolute dark, disgusting evil. Mm -hmm. You're playing with the eights or horror in your analysis. Mm -hmm. And you have to accept it because it just never goes away. And people see it. It's in. They do when you start it. I mean, yeah. It's kind of what we do when we challenge our clients. You know, when they try to tell you something, you see a bug. They're like, it's harder. But that you can only do after you have a very strong therapeutic alliance. It's not just that. Because then when they try, then they'll be like, okay, fine, I guess you're right. You know, you get that. But that's the beginning of healing. As an analyst, you've lost if your client says you're right. <laughs> they ha they have to discover it. Well, in mind. They yeah. have to discover so it. They usually say that. It's a it's a it's a so it's it's, right, it's an right, it's, it's an right, it's, 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 yeah, well, it's, it's yes, yeah. It's the but because they're like yeah you're right but it's always like because they're still discovering. It. So the best you can do is you can learn to live. They don't just agree with. You. The best you can do is you can learn to live with the shadow and avoid all the disaster causes in your life. You develop a deep, crushing humility of yourself in order to combat the fear and anger that you hold and project on the entire world. Worst case scenario with, with lack of success with shadow work comes out to, you kind of organizes in five, five different possibilities. Either one identifies with their shadow. You know, this is the person who embraces their, their poor, their poor decision-making. Their, their, their create, they live and, and thrive on the needless obstacles they, they give themselves. There's the identification with the persona. There's a shallowness the person adopts. They're, they're, everything is hunky-dory, fine and dandy. A neurosis can possibly develop where there's a war between one's individual, uh, one's one's sense of, of of conscious self and their and their shadow, and are never able to fully integrate it, but are painfully aware of both existing. There's a, the possibility of a, of a shallow spirituality developing, where where it, it's kind of like the idea of Nietzsche of the of the righteous coward where one, one chooses to be good only because of circumstance and fear of going against social norms as I opposed to having, <coughs> because he's, he's only being good because he fears because social, he convention, fears, uh, social convention as opposed mm -hmm. to doing what absolutely is right. And then there's ego inflation, you know, there's the, the, the self-fly grandiose, you know, uh, grandiose sort of expression. So, in, uh, so, Shadow work, and, and as a general rule, most people enter into Jungian analysis later in life because it, what Jung kind of observed in his own work, his clientele that were coming, and, and other analysts, you know, uh, definitely this is their experience, is that in the first part of life, people are just trying to figure out their ego and their persona. Who, wh 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 you know, okay, take, a, take, the, take the big five personality test and, hey, what, what are your job, what do you want your job to be? Hey, what do you do? I'm a doctor. Great, that's your persona. That's the first stage of life is what people are tackling, and, and it, it, there's not a lot of meat there for, for uh, analysis. So people are generally entering into analysis in the second stage of life where they want to confront the shadow. And I'm not going to get into this today, time's sake, but also the anima, what their, what their better angels are and what, they, what their ideal is fundamentally and what they, their, their encounter with the soul, so to speak. Would that be more like the Israel Uh I hesitate to say yes. But for a lot, yeah, why not? Why not?
Okay. I really oh. suggest you all read this book, The Matterhorn Estimate by Robinson Davies. It's all in there. Okay. The Matterhorn by Robinson Davies, where he goes through all of these things. It's a great introduction to young Ian. I do not know why my grade 13 English teacher gave it to us, but he wanted us to have depth and meaning in our lives. He has all sorts of interesting meaning. And I suggest you read it. Robinson what? Robinson Davies is a Canadian author. And he wrote the book, The Matacor, and it's all about this. You read it, it's all coming back. But it's like really cool the way he does it. What was the first thing you said um, when things go bad? You said neurosis, war, going with the shadow, shadow spirituality, ego inflation. I think he, the first one you said, I think. It's kind of uh, I just identifying with the shadow was number one. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. And then identification with the persona. Uh huh. Yeah. Was a, I think that's the one we missed. Okay. Okay. Now, before jumping back into the narrative, I think it's worth mentioning the the five. There's really eight, but but Jung doesn't. He kind of leaves off seven and eight in his in his work. But there's five levels of consciousness that people go through life. The first, Jung Jung calls the participation mystique. This is this is the the awareness. This is full projection that 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 you are the external world. Uh, theorists, you know, and from different the psychodynamic camps, they're getting very much you know in more into the the mother child relationship. That I'm mom, mom is me. There's a lack of individualness, but that that one is putting their entire consciousness on the external world. Um, this is the sort of a thing where, you know, when you're say, you know, your your computer crashes and that's feeling of terror that the computer won't start. That that's that's the participation mystique is like, well, it's the computer, not you, man. Don't worry. Like, why are you afraid? You know, I understand. Okay, pragmatically, but like, you know, like really, it's over the top. Um, the anger people feel towards close close friends, family members, things like that is like, okay, like I hear you're angry, but like seriously, come on. There there there's a, a lack of in, in, in a sense of individuation at this level, and a, and a, and a, a, I don't want to say enmeshment, but yeah, for, it's a, extreme enmeshment. That's probably a better way of putting it. Um, the, the the next stage of consciousness is localized projection, where there is a sense of okay, well, there's things that are other outside of me, but I have the stuff that's mine. I got my wife, my table, my cup, my job. You still have that projection in the participation mystique. But it doesn't extend towards the entirety of the world. Um, here's where, and again, I said, when I, said I wasn't going to do the anima, but there's a lot of the, the idealization, especially, you know, very much highlights the idealization of family members. You know, your, your wife is the most amazing, or your husband the most amazing human being on the face of the planet. Guess what? He ain't or she ain't. But th that's but you know what? It's beautiful and wonderful and stay in love. So that but that's 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 where all that sort of projection, the hope. Uh, uh, that one has in themselves is being put on, or fears are putting put on the external world. Jung argues this is where 99% of humanity stay. They don't go farther. This is where we're at, and just assume you're here, and it makes everything work, you know easier to deal with. Because it fosters a certain level of self-scrutiny. But by assuming, yeah, Jung's probably right, we're all here, there is the chance of being able to move towards the third level of consciousness, which is is a, a being able to f uh, free oneself from their projections of people and apply them to con uh, to uh, to abstract concepts. This is this would be this would be where you would see a person de-idealizing friends, family, other people, de-idealizing themselves. To a, to a great extent in how they see themselves, their persona. And there's the emergence of religious experience, morality, law, that what, how Jung kind of saw this was that instead of projecting on people, you're projecting on these ideas, these, these big themes that can, can be guiding lights in life. There's a, a certain magic that compensates for the loss of meaning that one begins to notice in their personal uh, personal relationships it's it's a it's a, it's a it's a fake out that that people will kind of feel as though well that that valence that energy that you have with 
you know, family, friends, whoever in your life, well, it's just not there anymore. And well, Jung says, well, yeah, it's not there because you took away 95% of the energy. 95% of that was you. You're putting that there. And so, of course, it feels less magical because you're starting to wise up to who you are and who other people are not. But that energy, that, that sense of purpose, the majesty, journey, is being projected now on religion, law, these sort of these sort of things, fate, God, all these sorts of things. So instead of passion compelling one's actions in life, the the emotional valence shifts from passion to duty. The fourth is a radical extinction of projection. This one is messy. There is an extreme, this is an extremely dangerous stage of consciousness because it, it kind of comes out where you can either go two ways with it. You can either move on to the final stage of consciousness, assuming we're ignoring the other last two, or there is this development of this deep-seated narcissism that there is no meaning. You are the master of everything. If all of it's a projection, you can just decide whatever the hell you want to do and whatever the hell you want things to mean. And a part of Jung's work, no, I mean, I mean, most of Jung's work, was in order to try and push back against this artificially imposed state of consciousness on modern man. Postmodernism, the, the Nietzschean idea of the death of God, has, whether we like it or not, forced this sort of meaninglessness on all of Western culture. Nietzsche saw it, Jung saw it, the writing was on the wall. Shades of gray, everything is shades of gray. <laughs> yeah, what do you mean? Acceptable. There's no absolute. That's right, yeah. There's no absolute. Everything goes. It, it depends. It's like it, there's no there's no moral compass anymore because there is no such thing as morality, perhaps. That that's the that that's that's the tension in this level of consciousness. So so that 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 unnatural confrontation with the death of God, which, by the way, Nietzsche was not happy about. I mean, he, he, Nietzsche, in that, in that phrase, despite Time Magazine's quoting it as, as though it's some, like, big Kiddish, uh, you know, N Nietzsche, Nietzsche called all the destructions of, of humanity in the, in, the, in, the, in the modern world that he said, there's not going to be enough water to wash the blood off our hands because of this dilemma. Within, within our work, Sure, we have to contend with that, but this is this is also how the Jungians would understand the the sharp rise in narcissistic traits. You might not you know, there there is some there is a there is a rise in as a personality disorder. It'll never really go above like four or five percent because people get ticked off at narcissists and just beat them down. But but in terms of the traits themselves, there is a magnification of narcissistic traits within society. Don't you know who I am? I mean, it's a, that 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 with Facebook, with with uh, social you know the social comparisons being being mo uh, being pushed even farther with uh, Instagram and things like that. The, this is, this is a, a troubling um, thing that we all have to confront. And I, I do believe Jung is able to confront it. Uh, from, from anybody I've... In, 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 in the world of psychology, he's the one that's able to confront it most effectively, by my, by my, by my estimation. So that's the fourth level. Then there's the confrontation with self. If you're able not to fall into that narcissistic trap, there's there's this last stage where where your one is able to f fully accept that yeah ninety nine point nine percent of what your interpretation of the world yeah it's probably projection but you place yourself under scrutiny it's by this this deep conviction it's you not them that saves the individual and enables the individual to move past that fourth level of consciousness and fall, not fall into its trap. It fosters an act of empathy, that one is able to use himself as a model 
in order to better understand different people who have achieved different states of consciousness. Uh, you, you know, uh, 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 very similar is uh, Yehuda Levi in the Kuzri. He makes a similar argument uh, in his in his works in terms of in terms of the Talmud Chacham being the the one who ought to rule, kind of like Plato's uh, Plato's uh, you know philosopher king. He went through it all so he can recognize it all. That's that's this stage of conscious development. So it becomes incredibly moral. There isn't the sense of meaninglessness. There isn't the sense of postmodern garbage, because it all becomes about you. The only way that you can make the world a better place is if you forget the world entirely and mind your own backyard. That is this final stage of consciousness. So bringing it back to the narrative, Avram's nine trials did deepen his sense of consciousness through his confrontation with all of his complexes and specifically his shadow all along the way. Him, him moving out of Urkazdim, confronting the famine in, in Eretz Yisrael, those moved, him, uh, th those moved him out of the first level of consciousness. There is a separation of him and other. I can give up my family, they're not me. I can recognize that life is more complex, and hey, sometimes there's famines. I realize there's something outside of myself. There's that in those first two uh, trials, there's that first level of consciousness achieved. The third, the unjust violation of, of his wife, Sara, is, 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 a, is, is developing further the second level of consciousness that the the my wife versus not my wife you know it's it's hitting too, even my wife putting it is it's hitting too close to home in one sense deepening their relationship vis-a-vis -vis the world at large the war with the four kings taking Hagar as a wife Mila the, the again the taking of Sara, you know, version two here is it is is it developed the third level of consciousness, a moral spiritual experience. War is incredibly spiritual. The, the transcendence, especially you know, reading reading accounts of of observers who watch soldiers die, say in the trenches of World War One. It was it a lot of those writings are so romantic of men dying and that were enemies on the battlefield holding each other as as you know the Tur Turks and the English are, are dying together. The sort of si singing singing to one another as they're dying. There's a there's a romance there, and it, it, not to be a union here, but bringing out the 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 idea of 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 um, the the relationship in mythological terms between Aphrodite and and the the god of the god of war there's there is that sort of they have a duality to them so okay you know I had I had to make a union a union analysis somewhere here uh, on top on top of the the moral condition of sacrificing his own life risking his own life for another human being it's the right thing to do taking Hagar again the, the same idea of this it's the right thing to do you know it's 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 going to hurt our relationship and it certainly did you know there was there was definitely more implication there but there was a there was a, a shikola das and what is the right thing in terms of perpetuating the values that I was developing with his wife Sara uh, so we had those themes there uh, trial eight and nine is is moving Avraham into the fourth level of consciousness, the removal of projection, seeing Hagar for who she really is. She ain't that good. It's not a really good idea uh, to have her around as much as Avraham you know, was emotionally uh, invested in her and the, person, the, the projections that he had placed on her as well as the projections he placed on his son. There was a certain cutting off of who he is and who they are and confronting the reality is that who he wishes they were is not who they are. And then we get to the 10th trial. Before looking at that one, of the Akedas Yitzchak specifically, I want to talk a little bit about, well, what's an Yisayim? So like I said, I'm going to be adopting the position of the Rambam. In Morin Vuchim, the Rambam brings out a three-way machlokas. 
of how one understands what an isayon is. In fact, he says there that there is no more difficult and troubled concept to struggle to, not just understand, but defend and, and, and to, to, make, to, to make sense of an integrated Judaism than an isayon. That's a tough one, he says. And he offers three different shitas, three different positions of, well, what really is an isayon? Position number one uh, is uh, sending hardship to increase ultimate reward theory. The uh, Isurim Ababa, that, that God is going to pot you, not because he doesn't like you, just because he loves you. And so he's giving you a greater halak, a greater portion in the world to come by giving you great challenges. The Rambam says this is, it is a minority opinion with, in, within, within Hazal. It, it is within Shas, and uh, Rav Sadia going, for example, in his Amunus Videos, concretizes it as his, as his particular outlook of what Nisayon is. It is a legitimate Torah belief, however, the Ram says, yeah, but it's not the, it's not, it, it is not the majority opinion. He brings Gemara Shabbos as a proof to his assertion that, that we have a, a principle, there is no such thing as death and suffering without sin. There isn't any. Complete categorical rejection. It's the Stam Memra, and the Rambam learns that so yeah, that this is the majority opinion. It doesn't exist, this idea. The second view he brings is not found in Shah's, is brought by different Rishonim. They they're 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 going to be pulling uh pulling uh, the idea out from Barishis Rabba, the idea that um to uh, the the Giving one challenges to re to release their potential and actualize their potential. That's theory number two. The medrash over there is the medrash how how you know God will never you know it's like the 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 artisan will never hit the clee the weak clee he only hits the hard clee. That's ambiguous. The the Rambam does not accept this as being a part of the Sora. It is outside of Shas. Is that a raya? Rambam would argue no. The Drushus Aran and the Ramban would say, yeah, oh yes, it is a raya. And so we have a mach locus there, but it's, a, it's, it's to be fair, it's, it's, a, it's a hard one to prove, but you can make the argument. The Rambam sees this as being insulting to God. It's 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 all, the way that he the way that he kind of looks at it is, and some Rishonim actually do do go this far that it's that's it's not just the the actualization of potential, but it also happens to be like God didn't even know what was going to happen. It was like oh God was surprised you were able to pull that off, and and there's that element the Ramam for sure doesn't like. It's, he kind of looks at it and says well God's not an idiot like he kind of knows everything. So like you know slow your roll there guys. Who says that? Before? Wait. Who says he doesn't know? Ibn Ezra would make an argument. He said yeah, 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 it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, go, go. You, you want to learn a lot of really interesting things? Go read Ibn Ezra. Yeah. <laughs> he says a lot of cool stuff. God's conscience doesn't extend past planet Earth. I mean, he's. Yeah. Yes, 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 yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. But the. the that, that, but not in the sense of. Not in the sense of it being. It, that it would be that, but there's no distinction between all actions where the Rambam is describing. Well, God knows everything, so like it's always potential being actualized. God knows everything. Well, that's everything. There's there's what makes a Nisan unique. So the Rambam kind of says like, well, that's that's everything. There's nothing special here to give it a special name of Nisayon. That would be kind of how the, how the Rambam would approach approach that. Then there's the Rambam Shita, where he makes the claim that. And he makes it based on based on etymology of the word of nays as, as being a, a revealingness, a, a, a flag, you know, all these different sort of like symbol. It's a symbol that, that the Rambam argues that a, a test in Isayon is the creation of an archetype that did not exist before. Uh, Taurus Avraham mirrors this. Uh, this idea that he, he calls it a or chadash, that a nisayon is something that exists outside of teva. And it's kind of cool over there, um, you know, listing off, well, learning Torah is teva, is, 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 is nature. Uh, uh, pulling, your, pulling yourself away from sin, that's nature. You know, uh, seichel, all that's nature. The, the, a test, a nisayon, is something outside of nature. So the Torah Avram, he, he expressed it more, more poetically in the Rambam, but it's a, similar, it's a similar idea. It's the creation of something yesh ma'ayin, an archetype. It occurs when a unique individual 
is able to achieve this, this level of wholeness, their union, whereby he acts out this archetype for, as, as, a, as a, uh, a thing to emulate an action as well as to believe intellectually, both, both levels. And that's exactly how, in, in quoting, quoting uh, bringing out the, the Katie Sitzhoff, the Rambam uses this as an example, that, this, the, that the, the, the fundamental aspects of this archetype that Avraham created in this moment, in confronting his, his shadow, in bringing him, himself to this higher level of, con this fifth level of consciousness, was completely against human feeling. It was, it was completely rooted in trying to understand Hashem is Hashem. It was a moral act, it was, a moral, it was an attempt of a moral action executed with serious thought and contemplation. It was rooted in a sense of duty and that this duty was predicated on both love and fear of the source of that duty. Okay. I'm going to contend that the, the creation of this new archetype is not in the action of the Akedis Yitzchak. It's what followed after. In, in uh, Bimid Mar Rabba, there's a medrash. This broke my heart. I cried when I, I read this. I really, really, thinking about this, it was like a really, it's scary. I thought this was scary. The medrash says, well, what, what does the verse mean when it says that the ram was in the place of the sun? You know, Avraham discovers the ram. Okay, great, let's offer this instead. God said that he regarded it as if Yitzchak was actually being offered as, as, the, as the sacrifice. And Avraham replied, I will not move from this place. I am not going anywhere until you swear to me that you will never test me ever again. If I had not obeyed you, I would have lost everything that I fought for in my entire life. And God agreed, and God swore that he would never test Avraham Avinu again. This is the archetype. This is the next level of consciousness that Avraham Avinu achieved. All his life, including in this narrative, Lech Lecha, there's a call to go forward. Go out, do. Not as a boy. Even here, God asked very nicely, will you please, no, nah, will you please offer me your firstborn? This wasn't even a boy. But he answered the call of Lech Lecha his entire life, and good for him. He was able to go through the other nine levels of, of tests, achieve this level of consciousness that, that we get to benefit from this day, uh, until this day. But there's a there's a there's an ignoring of one's limits. Without Din, without Gvura, without the God of Moshe Rabbeinu, you're leaving out a lot in your life. You have to say no. That's what law is. Yes, this, no that. You have to know your personal limits. And in order to do that, you do indeed have to have to confront your darker side. You have to know what you're capable of. He was capable of killing his son. And we definitely get to as a as a as a happy as a happy uh, side outcome of this. We learn, yeah, Judaism isn't into killing kids. Don't do that. Hu hu there is no such thing as human sacrifice, which is which is I, I'm putting it in a very funny way, but we still kill kids to this day. We we sacrifice children for ideological reasons all the time. We sacrifice, we sacrifice children all the time for ideological reasons, all the time. The transgender movement. I will cut off my child's penis at the age of one and make him a girl because I think that's what I should assign his gender as being. Yeah. And I will pump his body so full of hormones he'll die of cancer. We sacrifice our children. And every society does so in mm -hmm. some way or another. Thank God it's not as bad here in Israel as it is in the United States. Yeah. Well, different sacrifices here. As always a sacrifice. That's right. There always is. And Big Pharma makes $1.3 million on medicine per child 
and $70,000 is made by each doctor on all these surgeries. Yep. The final stage of consci consciousness that Avram Avinu achieved was, like I said, he learned his limits. He learned the ability to say no. Out of genuine humility, without any projection on anyone else, this is not something for someone else to fix. This is not someone else's problem. I know I can't do this. Rosola Vechik quotes Kierkegaard as saying that the archetype of Avram Avinu, says Kierkegaard, was that he's the knight of faith. And Rosola Vechik says, yeah, we've got to add a word there. He's the lonely knight of faith. He has to be with himself. He has to be real with himself. And the only way to do that is to know what you're, the evil you're capable of and to know when to walk away. That is the archetype born out of the Kedis Yitzchak. Bringing back, what's the relevance to Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Yom Nirayim? Taurus Avraham, the Mushkiach, so, uh, River Gradinsky, for any people who don't don't know, he was one. He was one of the last uh, Mushkiachim of Slobodan. He 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 notes in terms of this this con the connection of this story to the Yom Narayim is is an encouraging story and is also a warning that we are during this time called upon to do tshuva. We must confront. We have to confront our shadow. We just got to do it. We have to understand ourselves, and we are going to strive, we're going to make the attempt of tshuva ma'ava, something that wipes all of error away. But says the Torah's Abraham is, again, slow your roll, man, because the, the archetype of the individual who was able to achieve tshuva ma'ava, o'avi, avram avinu, my beloved one. In order to achieve that level of tshuva, you have to go through something comparable to all ten trials he himself experienced. That is how difficult tshuva ma'ava is. And so, during this time of, of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, there is a mm, narcissistic inclination to think, we got this. We'll do it in a week. We'll do it in a month. This is a life goal. And so while the Yom Narayim are a call to transcend yourself and to change, you have to know how to say no and not put that on anybody else. Have a good hug, guys. Thank you. Thank you.